This is the Greg Bedard Patriots Podcast with Nick Cavins. This is the Greg Bedard Patriots podcast with Nick Cattles. Man, oh man, this offseason, Greg, it has been crazy. It's been bananas. It reminds me of the NBA. A lot happening in the NFL. Let's start with the breaking news this morning from Adam Schefter. Tyree Kill is on the trading block. It sounds like the Dolphins and the Jets are both involved. He's likely to land with one of those two teams. Your reaction to this news? Well, uh, I have a few different reactions. Number one, uh, from the Chiefs' perspective, uh, I'm not all that surprised. Um, I have been surprised on sort of like their level of faith in Tyreek Hill, you know, I guess is how I would term it, Nick, uh, in terms of a guy who had major, major red flags coming out of college. There was the domestic violence. Um incident that was very very serious that sent him tumbling down a lot of draft boards uh probably took him off a lot of draft boards in the nfl and of course you don't hear much about that anymore because he's uber talented and makes humongous plays and uh he helped win a super bowl and look i'm all for redemption stories we've seen it time and time again we've seen it with the patriots have um, you know, had some guys with questionable backgrounds on um, their team and it's worked out. So, you know, I, I, I get it. But <clears throat> Tyreek Hill, I could tell you just from limited personal experience, Nick, being around him in some locker rooms. How do I term this? There, There's always guys in every locker room. And I give the Patriots credit. There haven't been a ton of guys in the Patriots um, locker room that I got got this feeling from but there's always guys throughout my career and I've been covering NFL locker rooms for 20 years where the vibe you get from the guy the the reactions that you see from some of the guys that you're just like I I don't know about this guy I don't I don't trust him I don't like him um I have I have questions about his future and Tyreek Hill is one of those guys for me has been in my locker room interactions. I don't want to get into specifics, but you know, when, when I'm in locker rooms, I sort of back when we were in locker rooms, um, you know, I sort of, I, sometimes I like to sit back and observe and observe players. And, you know, when coaches walk through and things like that, and there have seen things I've seen out of Tyreek Hill in terms of his reactions to um, let's say certain media members that um, have made me you know question his maturity at times and so to me you know I think for the Chiefs it's a combination of that how much do I want to be tied to a guy who I still have questions about off the field um that could sink a franchise very easily we saw what happened with you know Michael Vick and the Falcons um but also Look, we have a talented team. We have Patrick Mahomes. We have Travis Kelsey. We have, you know, we just paid Joe Tooney. We're paying other guys. You know, I think they franchised the left tackle. There are some defense. Frank Clark is another guy iffy off the field that they paid. Um, You know, we can't go to the top of the market with everybody. We can't. I mean, there – and – the guys that we are going to go to top of the market, if all of a sudden Tyree Kill and the reports are he's looking for Devonte Adams type money, um, you combine those factors, and to me, it's all right. Well, let's explore trade. Then yeah. let's try to if we can get something. Maybe we move on. We recalibrate things like that. Maybe Tyreek is just a guy that I, we're not sure whether we can have a future with for a variety of reasons. The wide receiver position seems like something that the NFL is having an issue addressing as far as value goes. And you see what happens with Devontae Adams, how much money he was paid. He goes for a first and a second. This deal is going to be huge as far as assets and money. And it comes down to, you know, the cost of a receiver and the importance to the team, because as we've seen the last three drafts now, wide receiver has been a very deep position. So you can find guys who can be your number one and not pay them like this. Marquez Valdez-Scantling sounds like that might be the plan for Kansas City to go from Tyreek Hill to to MVS is a huge, significant drop. And I think it's interesting to see how this offense is going to change for KC. 
the cap is crap crowd takes a hit here because you just can't pay everybody, as you said, Greg, at the yeah. top of the mountain. It, it, you just can't do it. And it, it's interesting, a couple of years ago, after they won the Super Bowl, Tyreek Hill was talking about seven rings. I think this is a reminder of how difficult it is to sustain a Super Bowl window. Guys get paid. Guys want to get paid. And the final connection here, Greg, the AFC East for the Patriots, he's going to go to either reportedly Oof. Dolphins or the Jets. It gets tougher for them. Yeah, Nick, you bring up a really good point, and it's sort of Patriots related. So, you know, let's discuss it a little bit. Um, you know, I understand the cap is ca- uh, the cap is crap crowd. I understand that. Um, and I do think, look, do probably my main criticism of the Patriots this offseason is there. Look, I understand. I understand more than anybody that and that the reason for their sustained success over 20 years, a large part of it was Tom Brady. And we don't know whether the same financial plan that worked with Tom Brady is going to work with Mac Jones or any other quarterback. But, you know. The, the Patriots, this is one thing you can't question. And, and you could debate how much of it was Tom Brady. And there are some people who just go, oh, it was all Tom Brady. But their, in, their ability year in and year out to be contenders over 20 years is just unmatched. Yep. And, you know, I, I a large part of that, I think, was Tom Brady. A large part of it, I do think, was their fon- financial responsibility in terms of, you know, nobody made like – you know, a huge amount of money and they kept the middle class, you know, pretty big and, and things like that. But, um, you know, I do think that, and, and the flip side of that is, yeah, you can, you could spend, you could do what a lot of teams are doing right now. Like say the Raiders and chiefs and, um, you know, the saints are a great example because they're up against it right now is you could push out cap into the future years, but the bill's going to come due. And you might get up for, you might be a Super Bowl contender or winner for a season or two, but at some point you're going to go down. And the Patriots never really went down um, during that, that 20 years. And so, uh, you know, we'll have, it'll be proven whether it was Tom Brady was the difference or was it a mixture of everything? I think it was a mixture of everything. Um, but I do think that the Patriots, like if they just, I wish they would thread the needle a little bit more. Like it seems like Belichick is either, Huge one way or huge the other way. Like last year, we saw them spend freely because they had an advantage. Now it's now we're not going to spend anything. Well, you know, knowing that the cap is going to increase coming in future years with the TV deals and the streaming deals and things like that, you know, you could push a little bit of cap out, you know, and and sign a few more guys. That's my main criticism of them. But uh, I, I agree with you that um, that there is a limit. And in people who think that there isn't is just they're just not talking about reality and and closer to home the AFC East, yeah. I mean, look, the Dolphins added Teron um, Armstead the other day, the left let tackle. Me you, let me stop you right there because we have the breaking news here as we do this. Uh, Tyree kills a dolphin, Greg. Uh, Adam Schefter. Adam Schefter tweets. Listen to this: five draft picks, my friend. Uh, Hill goes to Miami. Miami gives up their first round pick this year, a second round pick this year. That's number 29 and number 50, a fourth round pick this year, as well as fourth and sixth round picks in next year's draft. So Tyree kill goes to Miami for a first, a second, a fourth this year, and a fourth and sixth next year. Your immediate reaction to that deal, Greg, my immediate reaction is, uh, the Dolphins are going to be tough to defend this year. And yep. look, it's all going to come down to Tua. You know, and I do, I think Tua is better than, say, the conventional wisdom, or at least from, you know, a lot of Patriots fans I've heard from is that they think Tua's garbage. Well, he's beaten you, I think, in all three starts that he's had against you. Um, and I think that, you know, you get, they already have Devontae Parker. They signed Cedric Wilson on the offseason. I mean, Tyreek Hill, Jalen Waddell, and Cedric Wilson. Whew. That is quite the trio. And, speed, you know, the Patriots. Speed, speed and more speed. Yeah, and the Patriots right now, you know, have, uh, you know, Jonathan Jones coming back from injury. They have Jalen Waddell at cornerback. And they have Terrence Mitchell at the moment. And Miles Bryant, they're probably going to have to put a bunch of multiple defensive backs on the field, but 
Uh, again, it just seems it seems like the theme of this offseason, Nick, has been the AFC just keeps getting more and more difficult. And, you know, that was something that we were going to talk about and we will talk about a little bit more in depth. But, man, I look, it's it's it. This is no longer your uh, your uncle's AFC East where you could pencil in the Patriots just to win the division pretty easily. It's uh, yeah. Wow. And let's not forget that number 29 pick, by the way, is from San Francisco in the Trey Lance deal. So Miami still has a, a pick in the first round. So let's not forget Damn, about yeah. that. Um, Kansas City, look, that's a haul. I mean, that that is, you know, to get five or six picks for a wide receiver, even though it's Tyreek Hill, I would not be surprised if the Chiefs jump into the draft here with a couple of first round picks and draft a wide receiver. Chris Olave yep. is out there. Jamison Williams might be a guy who can fit that spot that Tyreek Hill's had. Um, so, you know, you look at the, the draft compensation, OBJ is still out there. I would not be shocked if OBJ says, Oh, wait, I could go be the number one receiver with Patrick Mahomes when I come yeah. off of base. Uh, so I think it's a haul for Miami. This is all, all for Tua. And, you know, if Tua can't make this work, then he's donezo in Miami. Uh, let's jump to some Patriot stuff. Trent Brown, he's back. What's it mean for the offensive line, Greg? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think this was a, um, I don't think this was a must. I think it, you know, it gives them more options. I mean, as of right now, you're looking at Isaiah Winnett left tackle. Um, you're looking at an assortment of people and possible draft pick at left guard or right guard. It depends. I'm just going to go with left guard as the open spot right now. Uh, they they had Ryan Bates from the Bills, who is a restricted free agent, who, you know, I think is a is a good, decent player. I thought that last year I was impressed with his film at the end of the year. He got a chance to start at left guard for the bills when John Feliciano was out and I thought the bills were better with Bates in the lineup. Uh, he Bates is basically a younger, maybe slightly better version of Ted Karras in that he could play guard and center. Um, and you know, is a solid player. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if the Patriots, if they do sign him to an offer sheet, uh, you're probably going to have to front load it. Um, we've been down this road before, Nick, with the Patriots in terms of restricted free agent offers. You know, remember when they signed Emmanuel Sanders to a, a, an offer when he was sort of an up and coming guy from the the Steelers, and you're like, "Oh, awesome!" I mean, okay, this is great. And then we saw the offer sheet, and it was easy for the Steelers to match. And the Steelers were up against the cap at the time. It was like, dude, it's not that hard to construct a contract where the Steelers can't match, and they just the Patriots just whiffed on it. The Steelers ended up matching. Sanders went back, and they never got that type of guy. So you hope if they're aggressive that they at least put together a, a tough offer for them to match. Um, yeah. You know, you have Andrews at center. This would put Awenu at one of the guard spots. I would think he's a right guard. You put Awenu and Trent Brown together. I do really like how the Patriots this time around, I thought they overextended for Trent Brown last year. Um, I think he had, you know, basically like seven and a half million dollars guaranteed. And it was a contract basically if he if he hit all incentives was nine million. This year, it's a two year deal with only like six and a, uh, I think four and a half million dollars guaranteed total. So that's good because we saw they got half a season from him. I thought that internally they thought that he declined a bit down the stretch. But um you know, look, the contract is constructed that he gets he gets paid the better he plays. So, uh, you know, I think it helps the Patriots. I don't think it was mandatory. I would have been fine, you know, with a Justin Huron or Yadni Kajus or something like that. But, okay, I mean, you know, good. I think they're better with Trent Brown. Now they only have one open spot. They can get that from the draft or try out their internal guys and see what happens. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think you don't want to lose Mason and Brown, a lot of holes to fill up front. The the contract, I love it, protects the Patriots. And it, it gives, you know, Brown that that carrot dangling in front of him. Uh, so I think the offensive line is better with Brown in the mix. And I do think they'll continue to add up front. Would not be surprised by that at all. By the way, some, some quick notes on this Tyreek Hill trade. Uh, the Dolphins now will not pick until... I think at, it's 102 that they won't pick until 102 overall after this trade. So uh, they're going to be very quiet on draft night. Uh, also, we have the contract figures, Greg, for Tyreek Hill. Four years, $120 million, $30 million average annual value. 
$72.2 million guaranteed. Wow. He gets $72 million guaranteed, which I think is $5 million more than what Devontae Adams got. I think Devontae got $67 million guaranteed. So, I mean, the Dolphins are paying huge. And assets, a lot of risk. A lot yeah, of risk. And assets and draft picks. And I, I appreciate you bringing up his past because I think people overlook that. Uh, Tyree Kill away from the field has not been a good guy. Let's just call nope. it the way it is. So we'll see what happens. And that's recently, too, not just his college days. And recently. now he's going to be in South Beach. Yep, South Beach with $72 million guaranteed. Uh, let's talk about Lenny Fournette quickly here, Greg. He visited New England. He went back to Tampa. What would you make of that story? I thought it was a pure leverage play uh, on both parts, both Fournette and also um, the Patriots. And I think that, uh, you know, Fournette is represented by Kim uh, Miele, who's a uh, Rhode Island native, big Patriots fan, um, sort of an up and comer for Jay Z's outfit, Rock Nation. Um, you know, she's done good work. She's young and, and really up and coming. Um, wouldn't surprise me if she has a bit of a relationship with the Patriots and said, hey, uh, can you help me out and create a little bit of leverage for my guy? Because the Bucks probably said, like, they were probably, eh, well, eh. and, you know, all of a sudden you go and visit the Patriots, which you know would be a sort of a, a button to push with the Bucks, <laughs> with Brady and also Jason Light, who used to be here and be like, you know, Brady was probably a little irritated. GM Tom Brady and probably got on the phone with Jason Light. Just like, dude, just get the deal done. Um, I, I won't even ask for more money or something like that. Um, so he got what he wanted. I do think that the Patriots were were sort of welcome this because if you noticed, uh, Damian Harris is in a contract year. And this is not to say they're not happy with Damian Harris. I think they love Damian Harris. And I think they would love to have him and Ramondre Stevenson here for a very long time. But Ramondre Stevenson last year looked like a burgeoning star. That the second half of the year, in my opinion and in my ratings, he was the he was the best back that they had, and he looks like he's going to be a star and could be the starter this year. And you would love to have Damian Harris around, but there's probably a limit to how far the Patriots want to go in re-signing a running back. And so, th- this it would not surprise me, Nick, is if the next thing we sort of hear, or maybe we don't hear is that the Patriots quietly go to Damian Harris and offer a contract extension that is very team-friendly after yep. he sort of has seen his mortality in, what, they're, they're hosting Leonard Fournette? Why are they doing that? They have me and Ramondre Stevenson. Why would they ever do that? Do they want to get rid of me? And it's like, oh, well, no, Leonard Fournette went back. But here, Damian Harris, here's a $5 million per year contract extension. Are you interested in that? If he says no, the Patriots start to start thinking about after Damian Harris. Um, that's sort of how things go with the Patriots. He could very well bet on himself, like we saw guys like uh, like J.C. Jackson did, where he turned down a team-friendly extension and bet on himself and wanted to get top of the market. We might see that with Harris, but there's no question that Harris's future, I think, while they would love to have him and they view him as a very good player and an up-and-coming leader and stuff like that, I, you have to be practical in how much... If you have Stevenson... You know, he's going to be your starter. You can afford to do other things. So uh, I see this as a win-win for Fournette and also the Patriots, and we'll see how it ultimately impacts Damian Harris. just want to know what that visit was like. Like, did they just talk about stuff other than football? Did they go out for lunch? Did they did they play a game of Parcheesi? Like, they, they knew. Who knows going. if he even got out of the hotel, Nick? I don't know if you saw my column, but if people want to I, – I wrote a column about – leverage in the NFL and about a lesson I learned in 2010 when Chad Clifton the left tackle for the Packers was a free agent and took a quote-unquote visit to Washington to get the to get Ted Thompson to move off what he wanted to offer Chad Clifton in in a contract extension and it's a pretty interesting story that people I I think will uh, open up some eyes on how things work in the NFL all right rank the AFC let's do this let's look at by level uh here's here's how I rank them right now Greg I want your thoughts I've got Cincinnati as the incumbent Super Bowl representative of the AFC. I've got them at the top of the heap. They deserve it. Joe Burrow, they've really fortified that offensive line, which was, I thought, their glaring hole. Uh, I think they're going to be better this year. Cincinnati, Buffalo, Cleveland, if Deshaun Watson plays, have no idea what's going to happen with him. But if he plays, I think the Chargers also jump up, adding J.C. Jackson, some other defensive players. I mean, that defense is really good. Cleo Mack. 
Khalil Mack. Yep. You've got Mack and you've got Jackson. You've got Derwin James. You've got Bosa. Uh, they've got tons of talent offensively signed Mike Williams to that extension. Uh, and then I would probably put Kansas city just out of respect, but Kansas city. Now they have a hole at wide receiver one and they have a big hole on the edge opposite of Frank Clark. They, they've got some question marks now yep. in Kansas city, but my top five right now on paper, this can change. It's early Cincy, Buffalo, Cleveland with Watson, the chargers and the chiefs. Yeah. So uh, what I did, I did an exercise at Boston sports journal this weekend where, uh, you know, every once in a while I like to sort of recalibrate because I think that, and sort of look at rosters and where they are. Cause I think that ultimately at the end of the day, how your blue chip elite players and red players who are very good players, how they end up playing for you uh, sort of determines how good you, you are and how far you can go. Um, and so I, I like to take a step back and sort of look at that. And I looked at the AFC just because I wanted to see, all right, where do the Patriots really rank right now? Um, in terms of the the talent on their roster. And again, this is just looking at the talent. And I also didn't look at individual offensive linemen. I basically went with, is your line good or is it average? If it's good, you get a you're in the plus column. If you're average and a lot of offensive lines at this point in time are average to me. Like the Patriots right now I have is average. They could be very well could be good during the season. I have no idea. I have to see the finished product. Um, but I looked at it and the Patriots among contenders and I didn't even put the Colts into this and I think it changes with Matt Ryan because I think Matt Ryan is a big upgrade for them yep I Um, agree I have them 12th in the AFC in terms of talent upper echelon talent on the roster and I'm not factoring in coaching because we know Belichick in the past we don't know with the new coaching alignment how they uh, how much they're going to improve the roster we know that Belichick has done that before um, he's coached them better than their talent level. So I'm not discounting that. And people shouldn't overreact to this because I do think that the Patriots obviously are banking on, and you and I have talked about it before. They are banking on some of their free agents from last year, from guys, some of their younger players, whether it's Mac Jones or Kyle Duggar. I do have Christian Barmore already in that purple chip, blue, red, purple chip area. Because I think he's, as a, at least as a sub-pass rusher, he is already there. He's already in the very good category, and I think he's going to get better. I did put Kendrick Bourne in there. I put uh, Hunter Henry. Matthew Judon. I have Jonathan Jones. He's coming back from injuries. I still kept him there. And Adrian Phillips. Those are the sort of upper echelon players I have on the Patriots roster right now. The Patriots are banking on some of their guys taking a step forward. I, you know, and that's, I have no problem with that, but... I don't know that. I don't know that they're going to take that leap. We'll have to see whether they're a contender is all going to depend on whether those guys take a leap. They could, but so that's the basis for me. Let's look at the guy, the teams that I think right now have that have a realistic shot at contending Um, the bills and the chiefs, the chiefs, you know, we'll see, this is breaking news. So uh, we'll have to see what they do, how it affects them. I think who they draft. I think you're right, Nick, with the new draft capital, um, you know, that 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 is going to be important. Um, I think that I was surprised when I went through this how talented the Bengals are. I didn't realize, you know, I, I had I was surprised. So I'm going to put the Bengals there. I did not think that they were going to be in that category. But at the end of the day, they came out that way. I think the Chargers take a leap into that that uh, upper echelon. Um, they are uber talented. I agree with you on the Browns. If Deshaun Watson plays half the season, they're probably up there. Um, and I would put the Broncos there as well. I think the Broncos are pretty talented and with Russell Wilson. So that those are sort of the contender status for me. That's the upper echelon in the AFC. I think they're all sort of in the same tier. Nobody is dominant in my opinion. I think that the the Raiders, yep. the Ravens, yep. Uh, I can't put the Steelers there right now with Trubisky, nope. even though I think they have some players on their team. The Titans, I think, are there. Now the Dolphins are there. And I think that's sort of the next tier right now. And then right behind them are sort of the Patriots. I would put the Colts with Matt Ryan in that tier. And then I sort of had the Steelers and the Patriots after that, where – Depending on, I don't know, if Mr. Trubisky suddenly good for the Steelers, then they could contend 
uh, for a playoff spot. I think the Patriots, should certain guys take a leap, which they might, Johnu Smith, Nelson Aguilar, Matt, uh, Mac Jones, Kyle Duggar, uh, maybe somebody, a linebacker, that sort of thing, then I think they're right there. But to me, that that's the way I see the AFC. I mean, I don't know how. I, uh, what do you think of where I sort of had the Patriots grouped? Do you think I it's think fair? In, yeah, I, I think you're in the right region, in the right area. I mean, I, you could argue they could be better than three or four teams right now in the AFC. I agree with your list, though. I mean, the, I gave you my top five and my next three because I do think – as many as seven or eight. I talked to Mike Lombardi about this yesterday on my show. There could be as many as seven, eight teams that could make a run in the AFC. I, I yeah. absolutely believe Denver's there. Vegas adds Chandler Jones. They add Devontae Adams. They trade for Rock Yasin. They added Anthony Averett. They're working on that defense. Um, Josh, I don't Jacob. even think I mentioned the Raiders. Yeah, they're, my, they're in that second tier for me too. I mean, what they've done. Yeah. Yeah. You've got Renfro, Waller, Adams, Jacobs on offense with Derek Carr, Josh McDaniels, play caller, Chandler Jones, Max Crosby on the edges. You've got Rock Yasin and Anthony Averett. I think they'll add another corner as well. They might be looking at Stephon Gilmore trying to drive that price down. So, yeah. And and you've got the Ravens. Uh, And, you know, I I don't take the Ravens as seriously as others do because they have one playoff one with Lamar, but they've got the talent. They've got the roster. Uh, all right, let's jump to the uh, bostonsportsjournal.com member question of the day, Greg. Uh, check them out over at BSJ. $39.99 on the annual plan. Not only do you get top-notch analysis of all the Boston Pro Sports, you're for Patch Junkie, which you are. Uh, membership at BSJ gives you access to a ton of video analysis Bedar does on the coaches' film, direct access to him in weekly chats. Greg, you'll find a question. Which question did you find, my friend? So uh, Brighton811 asks, just wondering, Greg, on which side of the ball will Matt Patricia be getting it wrong next year? Any credence to the rumors it might be on the offensive side? Um, well done, Brayden. Well done. Uh, yeah, from all indications, and I saw um, Matt Patricia at the Combine. He and I uh, chatted a little bit, even though I wouldn't say that he was exactly forthcoming, uh, nor do I think uh, I'm one of his favorite people in the world. But, we, you know, we had a nice chat, and it was nice to catch up with him. It's been a while. Um yeah, it seems like he's going to be the offensive line coach or at least co-offensive line coach with Billy Yates, who returns. Um, you know, Matt Patricia has experience at that. He was an assistant line, uh, offensive line coach when he first entered with the Patriots. Um, I know a lot of people are panicking about that. And it's – look, I, I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. What people people need to understand is, you know, you look at a guy like Dante Scarnecchia, who was here and a legend as an offensive line coach. Dante Scarnecchia did not enter the league as an offensive line coach. He just suddenly got given that job at some point in time. And you know what he did? He got in a car, drove out to Cincinnati to where, um, you know, Jeff McNally, who's a, who's a, uh, a legendary offensive line coach. Uh, they started doing sort of off season, like, Hey, tutoring other offensive line coaches, just talking about line play. It has now grown into the cool clinic, the coaches of offensive line, uh, clinic that I often go to out in Cincinnati. And basically, Scar just went out there. They gave him, they said, hey, you're going to coach offensive line. And he went out there and he found the smartest guys that he could think of, and they helped teach him the offensive line, and we saw what happened. I think that Matt Patricia will do similar. I wouldn't be surprised if he's talking to Dante Scarnecchia a lot. Um, and also, you have to understand that Billy Yates knows sort of how to teach the fundamentals and uh, you know where Patricia might be lacking like in terms of foot placement, hand placement, how are we going to do that? The, the increase in, in, what, how did, whatever, uh, <laughs> of the position. <laughs> it's been, sorry, I've been under the weather a little bit, so I'm a little, uh, but anyways, you put those two guys together, um, and Matt knows about leverage and other things. I don't think it's going to be an outright disaster. I'm going to give, I'm willing to give it patience, and, and I don't think that, uh, you need a master's degree to coach the offensive line. Uh, but it, it, I do think it's interesting, Nick. One thing on this is that, you know, the Patriots didn't love Trent Brown last year. Maybe there was some sort of issue with him and Carm Bursillo, the offensive line coach, where maybe the Patriots think that they can get more out of Trent Brown with Matt Patricia and Billy Yates than what he had last year. Uh, that was just one thought I had. So, yeah, Patricia looks like he's going to be heavily involved with the offensive line. And I don't think that's the worst thing in the world. I'm not going to bury them for it. Two quick things. If you bust Greg's balls about his offensive line breakdown, 
uh, because it's the offensive line and, oh, it's nerdy, then you have no right to crap on Matt Patricia as an O-line coach because you don't care about the offensive line, so stay out of that lane. Uh, I would also say that Tyree Kill, we got more contract details before we wrap this up. <sighs> you know, it's I, I think it's been a, an interesting last five or six days in the NFL. Deshaun Watson got $230 million guaranteed in full uh, with what's going on with him. Uh, according to Adam Schefter, Tyreek Hill, 72.2 million becomes fully guaranteed at the start of the 2023 league year. The other 52.535 million fully guaranteed at the signing. Wow. So as long as he keeps his head above water, he gets all that guaranteed money by the beginning of next football season. That is the impact of that Deshaun Watson contract that the Cleveland Browns signed and bent over backwards and helped him uh, back into the league with. This is what's going to happen. A lot of guaranteed money, a lot of it up front. This is changing the dynamics of NFL contracts. He's Greg Bedard. I am Nick Cattles, Greg Bedard Patriots podcast. We'll try to keep our heads above water like Tyreek Hill and uh, keep our eyes on the NFL because it is banana world. We'll talk to you soon. Be good, be healthy, be safe.